Hi, and welcome to lecture two. This is the first module of lecture two, um, and the first module of lecture two, part one, which is going to cover statistical inference and bivariate hypothesis testing. Okay. So in the first lecture, we discussed all sorts of broad topics about how we go about the scientific process, how we develop theories, how we measure our variables, how we design our research. Um, we'll discuss that really briefly at the beginning of this lecture uh, to sort of reiterate what our main point is here. But for the remainder of the course, we're going to be going into more in-depth nuts and bolts about how we go about testing our hypotheses. Okay. So let's start with a review of, of what we're doing. So first, we observe some puzzle or question of interest. This involves not only observing the identifying your, your puzzle, your question, your research question, but also identifying the units of analysis, right? Are we looking at the individual level, the state level, the country level, whatever? Um, and how that unit is varying temporally across time or across space or both. Then once we do that, we're going to create some kind of causal theory about how and why X affects Y, how changes in X affect changes in Y. Once we do that, and this could be a very broad theory or narrow theory, but it should be generalizable beyond the single case you're looking at, then we're going to draw out testable hypotheses from the theory these hypotheses might apply only to one case or maybe many cases. And there can be many hypotheses drawn out from a single theory. Once we do that, we're going to establish research designs to test our hypotheses. We're going to define units of observation. We're going to define temporal spatial domains of the study. And we're going to operationalize our variables. Right? So in the first part, we're looking at theoretical units, theoretical variation. Now we're looking at the actual concrete variation in our data and how to measure our theoretical concepts from our theories and hypotheses. Once we've done that, we're going to examine our data and test our hypotheses. Okay. The goal of all this, of the, of the testing part and, and the data um, gathering part, is to infer from some sample in our, from our data to a larger population of interest to our theory. The population here is all occurrences of your phenomenon of interest. So if you care about public opinion, it's all the people about whose opinion you care about. If you care about countries, it's all the countries that matter in the, in the situation you're talking about. The sample is a subset of the population of interest. Um, and our goal is going to be inference, to um, take information about the sample and infer that the traits that we saw in the sample also apply to the population of interest. This kind of statistical inference is always going to be implied, employed except in cases when you have the entire population. Practically, in political science or social sciences, that tends to be cases in which the population is relatively small, um, such as all the countries in the world, right? You could, and for certain variables, you can get data uh, for all the countries in the world. Not all of them, not all the variables possible for those countries, um, but for some variables, you can get data on all the countries, in which case you have the population of countries and would not need a sample and would not need to perform inference in that case. But for most situations, like say public opinion, you're going to be taking a sample of the population and you will have to perform statistical inference. Several times here we've mentioned parameters, but we haven't really discussed what they are. So I want to clarify to in depth, I want to clarify the stuff we did earlier about parameters. Parameters are just traits that can be quantified in some sample or in some population. These include things like averages, or differences between groups, or relationships between variables. Right? These are all um, parameters that you can assign to populations or samples. Typically, we use the Roman alphabet to apply to sample parameters, like the sample mean is x bar. And we use the Greek alphabet to apply to population parameters. So the mean for the population would be mu, lowercase mu, which is the Greek letter, which is the Greek letter. Population variables are the real variables. Um, the samples are the ones that we take from a particular subset of the population, and we try to use to infer details of the population from them. Our estimate here of the population mean is mu hat, also sometimes called x bar, right? That are often the same, typically. The hats mean estimates of a population parameter, whereas the Roman letters mean characteristics of the sample. 
Typically, we're going to use our sample to infer estimates of the population. So our sample estimates, our sample parameters, like x bar, are the same as our estimates of the population parameters, mu bar. Okay. So we go, remember, we, go, we take samples in the first place if we care about populations for a sort of reasons. One, we can't feasibly get data on every single pop piece, element of the population. Um, we can't always survey or document every occurrence of a phenomenon. Two, costs. Um, we can't always survey all cases. It's just too expensive. It's prohibitively expensive to survey all possible cases of population, so we choose a sample of the population. And practicality, right? Um, we may not need to survey the population because we can use inference oftentimes to get detailed, to sort of infer details of the population from the sample. So for reasons like those three, um, we don't necessarily take data on the population, even though that's what we really care about. We take data on a sample and infer things about the population from the sample. If we do a good job with that, then the sample parameters we have, the traits of the sample, will accurately reflect the population parameters, the traits of the population. Okay. Um, had a sample, well, this, there's a whole sampling procedure is, is complex, and there are a lot of different ways to sample. We're not going to skip over most of that and discuss the ideal sampling in many cases, which is simple random sampling. The idea is you have a whole population and you choose a sample completely at random. So every member of your population has an equal chance of ending up in your sample. And the reason that's optimal is the same reason randomization was really useful for experimental designs. Right? You're averaging over all the possible things that could make people's responses to a treatment different. So in this case, if you have a big population you care about and you choose people at random, you hope that if the sample is big enough, the, the, the sample you, cho you have chosen has roughly the same mix of relevant traits that might affect the outcome of your analysis, that might affect your treatment, as the population does. So on average, right, um, these parameters of the simple random sample will reflect the population parameters. Okay. So they're also useful um, because of what's called the central limit theorem. This is a key theorem in statistics that underlies a lot of what we're going to do here, and most of the today's um, module, this module right now, today's, this module is going to be going into what the central limit theorem is. So in short, the central limit theorem says that all sampling distributions follow a normal distribution, a bell curve, in the limit as they get very big in size. As the number of elements or units in the sample gets large, they tend to follow a normal distribution. Okay, um, you won't understand what this means yet necessarily because sampling distribution has not been defined, so that's what we're going to do now, is, is go ahead and fill in, the, fill in the gaps in our central limit theorem understanding. Okay. I'm going to do that with, with some examples. First though, to, to remind you what we did earlier, this is a picture of a normal distribution. The standard normal distribution has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And it looks just like this. The normal distribution is bell-shaped and symmetric around its mean. It has a mean, a median, and a mode all exactly the same, right here at zero. Further, we can tell predictably what the area is under the curve. The area under the curve is very important because it tells you the overall probability of observing a value between any two points. We'll get to why that is a little bit um, later in, the, in this lecture, but for a while I'll take my word for it. And the predictable um, areas look like this. So if you have a mean of zero here, 68% of all cases roughly will fall within one standard deviation of the mean. So if you were drawing things at random from something distributed according to a normal distribution, 68% of the time, the number, the value you drew would be between negative one and one standard deviation of the mean. In this case, if you have a standard normal, 68% of the time, you are drawing numbers between negative one and one. Kind of more important for us, 95% of the time, roughly, you are between negative two and positive two standard deviations. So 95% of the time, you're within two standard deviations of the mean. And finally, 99% of the time, you're within three standard deviations of the mean. This is true for all normal distributions, and that is incredibly useful, as we'll see, for doing statistical inference. Okay, so now, now that we know that, sort of back to the central limit theorem, 
The central limit theorem does not say that any variable in a sample is normally distributed, as we'll see in our example shortly. It says nothing about the distribution of our samples. Samples can be distributed very, very differently. If you're measuring income via a sample, we would expect to see an income with positive skew. Right? Most people would have incomes in, 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 a, in a particular range, and some people would have much higher incomes. Any sample we drew, any sample we draw is going to be only one of a number of samples we could draw. Right? Here's the key. Um, so if we draw a sample of income, we'll get a particular set of incomes that we hope is positively skewed because that's what we think the population is, but it might not be. The key is that sample is not unique. We could be drawing many, 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 many different samples from that same population. If you're trying to figure out the population mean, one way to do it would be to draw a sample, take its mean, draw another sample, take its mean, take its mean, and do it over and over and over again, doing repeated samples and taking the mean of each one. If you were then to graph those sample means, that would be the sample sampling distribution. The sampling distribution is the thing that the central limit theorem says will be normally distributed. So again, and this is a key point, and I want to reiterate now, um, at, from the course on, there'll be sort of fewer slides overall compared to the content, but it'll be very important to stop frequently potentially and, and, and go back and re-listen to certain things or just pause to think about some stuff. I'm not going to pause while speaking like I would in a, a live classroom just because I can't look at anyone's faces to see how people are understanding things or not. Um, I'm looking at a webcam. But for you at home listening to this, or wherever you're listening to this, um, pausing frequently can be very helpful. Okay, so to reiterate, what we're doing here is this. We take a sample of our population. We run the sample, we, we, we take the mean of the sample, the average value of the variable in the sample. We plot that, that mean of that one sample. Then we do it again, and again, and again, and again, taking hundreds or thousands of samples from the same population. We plot all those sample means you know, on, 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 a, on a plot, and the distribution we get from those means, from those, those sample means, is going to be a normal distribution. That is key, and that's what the central limit theorem says. As I make take bigger and bigger samples, the distribution of sample means I, I get will approach a normal distribution. So here's, and so let's work through an example to show how that works in practice. That might be more, more intuitive. What we want to know is what the, sh in this case, this example, is what the share of the vote the Democratic candidate receives is in congressional elections. Between 1946 and 2008, there were 11,720 contested congressional elections, not including special elections. These are real data, by the way. On average, the Democratic candidate received 52.5% of the vote. That number is the population parameter mu. There's no hat there. We're not estimating anything. We actually know that value because we've taken the whole population of all possible elections and calculated that mean. That's the population parameter, and there is no inference necessary. This is what the distribution looks like. Note, it, it's not, not normal, but it's not normal, right? It has a higher mode over here, and it seems a little positively skewed. Um, it is not a normal distribution. It doesn't have to be. The central limit theorem says nothing about the distribution of the population, which can be anything it wants to be. Now, hypothetically speaking, what if we couldn't actually, what if we didn't actually have access to data on all congressional elections? What if we had to go gather it ourselves? We could gather the entire population data in this case, but maybe we don't have the time or money to do that. So instead, we could take a sample of all possible, of all the congressional elections and take data on them. So the question is, how large of a sample, oh, sorry, how large of a sample should we take? So we're going to start with the sample size of 10, and we're going to first collect 10 samples of, the, of that of size 10 sam, of a size 10 sample, and then 10 samples of a size 100 sample, and then 10 samples of a size 1,000 sample. So each time we're increasing the number of units in our sample. 
Remember, the entire population is 11,000. So as we go from a sample size of 10 to 100 to 1,000, we're increasing the proportion of, data, of overall population data in our sample. Okay. Here's the first sample. I don't know line went. Um, we're going to randomly select 10 congressional elections. The mean of the sample, and this is randomly chosen, is 57.38. This is our x bar for that one sample. If we do that 10 times, we might, get addition, we might get 10 different values of the mean, because again, we're choosing 10 at random. They're not all going to mirror the actual mean. Remember, the true mean is 52.5, and here we get a whole bunch of values, and the ones in bold are the ones that are pretty far from the true mean. That's going to happen when we take random samples sometimes. Now we increase the sample size to 100. Same true mean, remember, but now the values tend to get closer to the true mean. So again, we, this time we took 100 elections from the overall population of 11,000 and calculated their mean in each case. Now I do the same thing with 1,000 sample sizes of 1,000 elections. Now they're really close to the true mean. So I still have taken 10 samples each time, but now as the sample size gets bigger, the means of each sample get closer to the true mean. That's always going to happen. And it's intuitive why it happens, right? As I have a larger proportion of the population in my sample, the sample mirrors the population more closely, and so its parameters, its traits, mirror the traits of the population more closely. Okay, so as we notice that, as our sample size gets larger, our sample means are typically closer to the true mean, and fewer are way off. Okay. So what's happening here? Well, for one thing, right, our samples look more like the population. Again, here's the population. This is our sample of one sample of 10, looks very far from the population. Here's one sample of 100, so they're closer, but still pretty different. A sample of 1,000, closer, still different, but much closer. So our sampling, so, to, besides, so one thing that's happening here is our samples look more like a population, right? Remember, here's your sample of 1,000, here's the population. That looks closer than the previous ones. That's one thing that's happening. But another thing that's happening is our sample means are getting closer and closer and closer to the true population mean, which is a good thing. Right? If I had to plot all these sampling, sample means, the distribution of them would get narrower and narrower and narrower, have less dispersion, and be more tightly clustered around the true population mean. In all cases, the expected value of the sample mean is going to equal the population mean. Right? But as our sample size increases, the errors um, of the, around that mean, the standard error of that mean decreases. So that all the various sample means get closer and closer and closer to the true population mean, and so the error around that mean, around that mean decreases. That increases our confidence in our inference. Why? Because as the values of the sample mean get, get closer and closer and closer to the true mean, we feel more confident that any particular value we chose in that sample for any particular sample mean we obtained would probably be closer to the true mean because all the values are closer to the true mean now with larger samples. Um, so that's good. So anything we got from, from any sample, any mean we got from a particular sample would more likely be closer to the true mean and would, or not that far off and would feel more confident about our, our estimate. Okay, so now let's add this draw a thousand samples instead of 10 samples. Computers can do that easily, so we'll, we'll do a thousand samples of 10 elections, then a hundred elections, then a thousand elections, and finally 5,000 elections, which is half of the overall population. And let's watch what happens to the sampling distribution. Now again, this is not the distribution, of, this is not individual samples we're looking at here, like we did before. This is the, these are the sampling distributions. So they're, they're, they're distributions of the frequency of means of each sample that we obtain. So if we do a thousand samples, we're plotting a thousand means where each mean is taken from 10 elections or 100 elections. So again, just to be super clear here, in this first case, in this first case over here with 10 elections, we, we draw 10 elections at random, we compute the mean, we plot it. We do that again a total of a thousand times. So we have a thousand points where each point is the mean of a sample containing 10 elections only. Okay. In practice, we're not going to have to do that because we know we have statistical training to be able to tell us 
that one sample, with only one sample, given we know the sample size, we have to figure out how much errors associated with, us, with that, that estimate and not have to take a thousand samples. But here it's helpful to look at what the distributions look like. Okay, so, um, and, and by the way, this, that last bullet point here, why we can know what the sampling distribution looks like as we increase the sample size, follows from the central limit theorem. And we'll get to back to that, that at the end of this module. Okay, so here's a thousand samples of 10 elections. The distribution looks kind of symmetric. It does center pretty close to the, the true value, but it's pretty wide, right? There's a lot of error associated with our, our um, sampling. And if we drew a particular sample, we might end up over here with decently high probability, and that'd be much lower than the true value. So we wouldn't feel as much confidence in our estimates. Now we have a thousand samples of a hundred elections. We've increased the sample size, and now the sampling distribution, while still symmetric around the true mean, is much tighter. There's much less variation in it and much less error. With a thousand elections, even more tightly clustered around the true mean. With 5,000, it's almost a, a, a single spike at the true mean. Right? So there's much less error involved, and we're doing a much better job of estimating the true population mean. And if we draw, if we had 5,000 elections in our sample, then we could be very confident that any sample we drew, regardless of what it happened to, be look, to look like, would have a mean very close to the true population mean. Okay. So to sort of wrap this up, um, what do we know about all this? Well, our goal again was to understand and learn the population parameters. Often we can only get sample estimates of these parameters. So what we do um, is take a sample. As our sample size increases, the expected value of our estimate is more likely to equal a population value, which our, sample, our, our sampling error decreases, and our sampling distribution takes on a known normal distribution. So increasing the sample size is always good, and it implies that our sampling distri distribution will more closely approach, um, approximate a normal distribution with known values and a mean that matches or gets close to it our population mean. So to, to sort of state the theorem more um, precisely, the central, limit theorem, the central limit theorem states that for any trade or variable, even those that are not normally distributed themselves, like income for instance, um, if repeated random samples of a particular size n, so each sample has n units, n data points, if these samples are drawn from any population, and each sample has some mean mu hat or x bar, however you want to write it, an estimate of their mean, and a standard deviation, sigma hat or s, then as the size of each sample gets larger, and we're assuming each draw has the same size, each sample you draw has the same size, then the sampling distribution of sample means, so the distribution of all the sample means that you draw, which we just, all the stuff that's been plotted on these plots, um, this sampling distribution will approach a normal distribution with a mean equal to the population mean, the true population mean, and the standard deviation equal to sigma hat, or s, divided by the square root of the size of each sample n. Um, so we would, we would be able to tell you in this case not only what a good estimate of the true population mean is, but also what the error is on that estimate. And that error is key. It sort of separates science from not science because I can tell you not only what I th my guess is, but also my confidence level, my quantifiable confidence level in my guess. And our goal and a lot of what we're doing here is to sort of shrink the, the, the error, increase our confidence in our guesses. Generally, when, I say, when we say n becomes large, a good rule of thumb is if n is bigger than 100, um, n's large and you have a normal distribution for your sampling distribution. For smaller n's, we're going to use different kinds of distributions. We'll get to that all as the course goes on. Um, now, hopefully the underlying logic here is clear. If not, it's definitely worth going back and listening to this again. Um, the importance and practical purposes will be more obvious as we go on in the course, but hopefully the concepts behind this that, this, that the distribution of sample means will more closely appro approximate a normal distribution with mean equal to the true mean as the sample size gets large. Hopefully that part is clear because that's the part we're going to be using a whole lot. Uh,